So one of the longest running science fiction series in network television history is The X-Files, which originated in the 1990s, started then, ran up to the 2002, something like that, but now it's back. How many of you are excited that now it is back, The X-Files, some of you, okay? All right, whoa, some real enthusiasm in this corner over here. <laughs> yeah, two in each service, whoa, all right. So, uh, now, in the show, X-Files are unsolved cases that involve the mystical and the paranormal. Phenomena collected by the FBI, but no one is really taking it seriously except for one FBI agent. His nickname is Spooky. He is passionately curious about these X-Files. He is happily willing to risk his reputation in order to go deeper, in order to find out the truth about what is going on. His name is Fox Mulder. Now, the first time we meet him, he is in his office. It is in the basement of the FBI building, in the very bowels of the basement of the FBI building. And you can't get any lower than that in the bureaucratic food chain, right? It is a clear message from his FBI bosses about their general attitude towards the whole FBI or, or whole X-Files business. So that image of the X-Files, just hold that before you right now. It is loaded with powerful themes, mystery and curiosity, but also denial and disdain and serious risk to one's career should you pursue them. An X-File means all of that together. And X-Files are not just fiction. Real life X-Files really exist. And I want to share one with you. I found it in a book by Elizabeth Lloyd Meyer, PhD, entitled Extraordinary Knowing, Science, Skepticism, and the Inexplicable Powers of the Human Mind. It is Dr. Meyer's personal X-File, and it changed her life. She writes, in 1991, I was teaching in the psychology department at the University of California at Berkeley and at the University Medical Center in San Francisco. I was doing research on female development and seeing patients in my psychoanalytic practice. I was a member of numerous professional associations, doing committee work, attending international meetings, functioning on editorial boards, and lecturing all over the country. I was a training and uh, supervising analyst in the American Psychoanalytic Association. I was busy, I was fulfilled, and life was running along the way life does. My 11-year-old daughter, Meg, who had fallen in love with the harp at age six, she'd begun performing. She was not playing a classical pedal harp but a smaller, extremely valuable instrument built and carved by a master harp maker. After a Christmas concert, her harp was stolen from the theater where she was playing. For two months, we went through every conceivable channel trying to locate it. The police, instrument dealers across the country, the American Harp Society news newsletter, even a CBS news, a CBS TV news, news story, even that, nothing worked. Finally, a wise and devoted friend told me, if you really want that heart back, you should be willing to try anything. <laughs> and then she said, try calling a dowser. Now, the only thing I knew about dowsers was that they were that strange breed who locate underground water with forked sticks. <laughs> but according to my friend, the really good dowsers can locate not just water, but lost objects as well. Finding lost objects with forked sticks? <laughs> well, nothing was happening on the police front, and my daughter, spoiled by several years of playing an extraordinary instrument, had found the series of commercial harps we'd rented simply unplayable. So, half embarrassed, but desperate, I decided to take my friend's dare. I asked her 
if she could help me locate a really good dowser, the best, I said. She promptly called the American Society of Dowsers. <laughs> this is the marginalia in my, my book of this. I'm like, what? <laughs> the Society of Dowsers? Who do? Back to the story. She promptly called that society and came back with the phone number of the society's current president, Harold McCoy, in Fayetteville, Arkansas. I called him that day. Harold picked up the phone, friendly, cheerful, very heavy Arkansas accent. I told him I'd heard he could douse for lost objects and that I'd had a valuable harp stolen in Oakland, California. Could he help locate it? Give me a second, he said. I'll tell you if it's still in Oakland. He... <laughs> He's in Fable, Arkansas, right? He paused. Then, well, it's still there. Send me a street map of Oakland. I will locate that harp for you. Skeptical. But what, after all, did I have to lose? I promptly overnighted him a map. Two days later, he calls back. Well, I got that harp located, he said. It is in the second house on the right on D Street, just off of L Avenue. I'd never heard of that street, <laughs> but I did like the sound of that guy's voice, whoever he was. And I don't like backing down on a dare. Why not drive to his house, the one he'd identified? At least I'd get the address. I looked on an Oakland map. I found the neighborhood. I'd never, ever been there before. I got in my car, drove into Oakland, located the house, wrote down the number, called the police, told them I'd gotten a tip that the heart <laughs> might be at, at that house. Not good enough for a search warrant, they said. They were going to close the case. There was no way, they said, this unique, portable, and highly marketable item hadn't already been sold. It was gone forever, they said. But I found that I couldn't quite let go. Was it the dare? Was it my admiration for my friend who'd instigated the whole thing? Was it my devastated daughter? Or was it just that I had genuinely liked the sound of that voice on the other end of the line? I decided to post flyers in the two block area around the house offering a reward for the harp's return. It was a crazy idea, but why not? I put up those flyers in those two blocks, only those two blocks. I was embarrassed enough about what I was doing only to tell just a couple friends that this was happening. Three days later, my phone rings. A man's voice told me he'd seen a flyer outside his house describing a stolen harp. He said it was exactly the harp his next door neighbor had recently obtained and showed him. He wouldn't give me his name or number, but offered to get the harp returned to me. And two weeks later, after a series of circuitous telephone calls, he told me to meet a certain teenager at 10 o'clock p.m. in the rear parking lot of an all-night Safeway. <laughs> I arrived to find a teenage young man loitering in the lot. He looked at me. He said, the harp? I nodded. Within minutes, the harp was in the back of my station wagon, and I drove off. 25 minutes later, as I turned into my driveway, I had thought, well, this changes everything. That's Dr. Meyer's personal X file. In the form of a dowser from Fayetteville, Arkansas, named Harold McCoy, in the form of that, she encountered evidence of a truly mystical faculty in human beings that transcends the limits of the physical, and all it needs is something to focus it, to give it expression. Well, I will tell you, it fired up her inner Fox Mulder. Her inner Fox Mulder fired it up. And also fired up her inner FBI bosses, who were very clear in their displeasure about the whole thing. Finding lost objects with forked sticks? Just imagine how she must have 
said those words to herself or how the idea of posting the flyer struck her as Looney Tunes. It is her desperation and her concern for her daughter and her admiration for her friend and her dogged unwillingness to back down from a dare that kept her engaged in her adventure with dowsing despite what those inner FBI bosses were telling her. Interestingly, when word got out about her experience, word got out to her medical and psychoanalytic colleagues, the dam broke. And all of a sudden, they began to inundate her with accounts of their own mystical experiences. Inundated her. These stories, she says, were all about knowing things in bizarrely inexplicable ways. Like, my patient walked in and I knew her mother had died. No clues. I just knew it instantly. Or, I woke up in the middle of the night like I had heard a shot and the next day I found out it was exactly when my patient took a gun and tried to kill himself. Or I suddenly felt that my partner's son was in trouble. I called my partner and it worried him enough that he tracked down his son. His son had been in a bad car accident and my partner got there just in time to make a decision about a surgery that I am sure saved his life. Elizabeth Meyer goes on to say, I was particularly fascinated by how eagerly my colleague shared even the most weirdly personal stories with me. Their eagerness puzzled me until I realized how badly people wanted to reintegrate corners of their experience that they had walled off from their public lives for fear of being ridiculed. Have you ever had experiences like Dr. Myers or those of her colleagues? But perhaps your inner FBI bosses have your inner, F, your inner Fox Mulder in a headlock. <laughs> and your story has remained unvoiced and unintegrated in your life, perhaps. This was so for many years for labor activists, feminist, award-winning journalist, and fourth-generation atheist, Barbara Ehrenreich, who, in her book, Living with a Wild God, described how she had endeavored all her life to come to terms with a mystical experience she had as a teenager when she was walking the streets of a small California town. In the pre-dawn hours of the morning, she directly and viscerally realized how she and the world were one. She says, the world flamed into life. How else to describe it? There were no visions. There were no prophetic voices or visit, visits by totemic animals. Just a blazing everywhere. Something poured into me, and I poured back out into it. It was a furious encounter with a living substance that was coming at me through all things, all at once. And one reason for the terrible wordlessness of the experience is you cannot observe fire really closely without becoming part of it whether you start out as a twig or as a gorgeous tapestry, you will be recruited into the flames. You will be made indistinguishable from the rest of the blaze. I could not speak of it because I lacked the words and I could not recapture the experience any more than a burned out filament could be used to light a fresh bulb. This is a real life X-File. And the FBI bosses in her head, Barbara Ehrenreich's head, very loud. They say, and Barbara Ehrenreich records their words faithfully, here we leave the jurisdiction of language, which where, where nothing is left but the vague gurgles of surrender expressed in words such as ineffable, transcendent. For most of the intervening year, years, she says, my general thought has been, if there are no words for it, then don't say anything about it. Otherwise, you risk slopping into spirituality. 
which is in addition to being a crime against reason, of no more interest to other people than your dreams. What do you think? Do you agree with her inner FBI boss assessment against her own inner Fox Mulder experience? That she is slopping into spirituality? That she is committing a crime against reason? Do you believe that? That if there's no words for something, well, shut up already. Everything has a background. Everyone, everything has a story. And so do our internal FBI bosses, where they are coming from. And so where is that? What exactly makes paranormal experience so off-limits, so impossible for them? Parapsychologist Hoyt Edge sees it as a consequent consequence, ultimately, of 16th and 17th century European thinkers trying to escape the oppression of the church, and doing this by basically dividing reality into two categorically different substances, matter and mind. The church would still be authoritative over the mind because the, the mind is the realm of values and purposes and free choices, but on the other hand, says Hoyt Edge, there was matter, which was non-thinking, had nothing to do with values. An atom can be neither wrong or right. The material world is simply a machine that is determined in its motions, and the only stake that the church should have into it is simply the assertion that it was the creation of God. Now, over time, this conceptual revolution triggered by philosophers like Rene Descartes would solidify into inflexible dogma about the way the world is, which is as bad as any fundamentalism that you would encounter in religion, a dogma that remains solid for most people even after almost 100 years of crazy, weird, mind-blowing revelations coming out of quantum mechanics, right? The dogma says that matter is completely inert, completely dead, just surface, no spiritual depth. Hoyt Edge teases this out into three claims. Number one, reality ultimately consists of basic units, and in the material world, these are indivisible material bits. Number two, atoms, those atoms, they exist in a void. The purpose of the void is to separate the atoms, which are self-sufficient in themselves. They are not connected to or dependent on any of the other atoms. And then number three, action occurs through contact. One atom bumping against another. That's the inner FBI conviction. That is the dogma. So when it encounters something like dowsing, <laughs> which dares to suggest that mind and matter are not categorically distinct, but that mind and matter can mix and mingle and merge in ways that confound science, well, instant rejection. It's got to be impossible, but it is not impossible. It happened. Things like this can happen. Elizabeth Meyer got her heart back, put it in her station wagon, drove home, turned into her driveway, and that was the moment when she realized that life had just addressed her with a huge question, and she would need to work hard to come up with some answers. She would have to unleash her inner fox, Mulder. She would have to. And this is why I am a Unitarian Universalist. <laughs> I'm a Unitarian Universalist because I believe that the world and God are just too big to be defined by any one metaphor and by any one way. The reason ours is a creedless faith, says the Reverend Bill Schultz, is because we have a theory about creation and our theory unlike that of most religious traditions, is that creation is too grand, it is too glorious, it is too complex, it is too mysterious to be captured in any narrow creed or reflected in any single metaphor. And this includes metaphors that come from reductionist, materialist science and the heirs of Descartes. Life is continually addressing us with huge questions challenging us to open our minds, to open our hearts. And that is what our faith calls us to do, even when we are talking about weird stuff like 
the mystical. Now, you know, the X-Files TV show, the, on that show, a main theme is conspiracy. If you've watched that show, you know, right? Conspiracy is a main theme. People wanting to silence Fox Mulder because if he does find out the truth, whoa, the truth is just, it's, it's going to be horrible. In the show, the conspiracy tries to cover up the truly, the truly horrifying fact that the government is engaged in awful biological experimentation on human beings, right? Sorry, I just, I just spoiled it. I, realized, I just realized that. Oh my God, I'm sorry. I'm so sorry. Just, yeah, that's right. Great, great. All right, I got to plow through the rest of this sermon and then I'm going to go cry in my office. No, sorry. So, that's the show. But in the real world, what is being covered up is the opposite of terrible. The opposite. If our inner Fox Mulders were given free reign, I believe that what would come to collective light is the realization that our Unitarian Universalist seventh principle is true, but in deeper ways than we might have ever thought. How this interconnected web of all existence is such that a dowser in Arkansas can use a piece of wood to discover something true about what is going on in California. How interconnectedness means that a therapist can wake up in the middle of the night thinking that he'd heard a shot, and later he learns that at that exact time he woke up, his patient had tried to shoot himself. How interconnectedness means that a teenager in the 1950s can experience the world flaming, flaming into life a furious encounter with a living substance coming at her and that living substance is coming out back at that world and she became one. She was one with it all. Appearances are deceiving. The boundaries of our skin appear to be the boundaries of ourselves, but it doesn't have to be. Mystically, mysteriously, people, things, planet, we are connected in far deeper in more fundamental ways than atoms colliding. There are time standstill moments when we come to know who we truly are. We stand on the edge of all that is great, says the true life version of Fox Mulder, who comes from our own spiritual tradition and who devoted his entire life to blowing the lid off of the conspiracy in his day, which was 150 years ago. I am talking about Ralph Waldo Emerson. Thank you. Where's the rest of you? <laughs> Seriously, he is our Fox Mulder in our tradition, and we have a bunch of others of them too, women and men. We stand on the edge of all that is great, he says yet are restrained in inactivity and unacquaintance with our powers. Like workers of the hive, every one of which is capable of transformation into the queen bee. We are always on the brink of an ocean into which we do not yet swim. But suddenly, in any place, in the street, in the room, Will the heaven open and the regions of wisdom be uncovered as if to show how very thin the veil is? So let the heavens open. Let the heavens open. Let the regions of wisdom be uncovered. Let us know how truly thin the veil is. 